Hey guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. I've been getting a lot of questions and comments from you guys, so thank you. Keep those questions and comments coming. Today I thought I'd take a few minutes and answer some of these questions. So hopefully, even if you didn't ask this question or these questions, you're interested in the answer, so please stay tuned. So first I have a couple comments. After I posted a video about enclosure size, I got a lot of feedback, so thanks everybody. And a lot of the comments were um, around um, you know, commenting on, well, my boa is in a cage that's smaller than what you recommend, or, you know, my boa is in a different type of cage, things like that. And so I just want to stress that my videos are guidelines, okay? These are general guidelines, what works the best for most people based on my own experience. Your mileage may vary, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. In fact, take pretty much everything that anybody tells you about boas with a grain of salt. Your own experience and the knowledge you gain uh, by yourself is far more valuable um, you know what what is in my videos may not apply to your situation okay and as far as the size of the cage a lot of people commented that they tried bigger cages and their boa stopped feeding or had some kind of husbandry issues that can happen some boas just like smaller spaces you know that's why they want these small hiding places that's why I recommend them for people boas like to feel confined in a small space it makes them feel secure and the wild they're just gonna go hide in some you know tight hiding place like that and I've had boas that I put in larger cages and especially like a large display style cage they start rubbing their snout and they're having husbandry issues and then I put them back into tubs like this and these are my vision boa tubs. They're 30 by 40 inches. I build the racks myself. My boa seem to really like them. And sometimes when I remove the boa from one of these tubs to a larger cage, it doesn't do so well. And I end up putting it back in the tub. So your mileage may vary. Take everything I say with a grain of salt. Okay, the next comment is about my annual BOA of the year episode. And someone said, I really like your BOA of the year episode. And you know, the end of the year is coming up, so I have to start thinking about this. They asked if I'm gonna do it again. I said, yes, I will try to do it again. But I've been really thinking the last few days about what is the BOA of the year for 2023, and nothing really comes to mind. It was kind of a challenging year for BOAs as far as the economy and things like that. So if you have a BOA, that you think deserves the title of 2023 BOA of the Year, please comment below and please tell me why you think your specific BOA should be the 2023 BOA of the Year. Next, a couple questions about breeding. First question, how do you tell if a breeding attempt is successful? Do you look for signs of ovulation or do you look for whether your female is acting gravid? So the real answer to that question is I can tell if a breeding was successful if baby boas are born. My approach to breeding boas is generally hands off, let nature take its course. I want to prepare my boas as best I can to get them ready for breeding. But then when I put males and females together, it's up to them. And I don't, I try to interfere as little as possible with my males and females. I check on them, you know, a few times a week, but generally speaking, I just don't interfere. I just want them to do their thing and have nature take its course. So I not you know, um, always checking to see if females are ovulating or exactly what's going on, writing down every single time I think they're copulating, things like that. Uh, often I don't even see it, ovulation. Sometimes the signs are pretty subtle in many of the boas I work with, and it's really not important anyway. You know, all that matters is if a female becomes gravid and has the litter of babies. It doesn't matter exactly when it ovulated. Uh, it's just not all that important. So basically the way that I know that they're gravid, when they start acting gravid, when they start, the females will be coiling over the hot spot. They sometimes will be refusing food, not always. And then often they will turn a little bit darker. So um, that's kind of what I look for. And then I kind of assume that they're gravid and then you know look for a post ovulation shed and write down the date. So I know about when to expect the babies to be born. And so then a related question on breeding is, how many attempts does it take for a breeding to be successful? And this can be all over the place, depending on what you define as attempt. Um, and I, you know, in a perfect world, one attempt is all it takes. And I once had a situation where I briefly put a male and female Argentine boa together. 
just for a few hours. This is actually my second litter ever. And uh, I, then I separated them back into separate cages. The female actually became gravid and had babies, you know, three or four months later. This was back in 2007, my second litter of Argentine boas. And uh, so it can only take one attempt in many, some cases. Often it takes many, many attempts. Um, you may need to do a second attempt. You might try breeding a boa one year, it doesn't work. You might have to follow up the following year and put together the same pairing. You know, if you define that as an attempt, or if you're talking about the same year, you may have to keep animals together for, you know, three, four, five, up to six months before the female becomes gravid. So it can take many attempts uh, to breed boas to be successful, uh, depending on how you define attempt. And for some reason, my boas are really antsy to, today. I uh, this. Suriname, this is my male Pink Floyd. He doesn't want to hold still. I had a Hog Island boa out momentarily in the last scene and she didn't want to hold still. So I think maybe because these uh, animals are getting a little antsy because it's the breeding season and they've been off feed for about a month. So maybe that's why they're not holding still. But uh, I may have to grab another animal that uh, wants to hold still for the camera. Hopefully this female Tarahumara will be a little more, a bit more cooperative. She's actually not breeding this year. Okay, next question. Where are we? Will you be pairing this year Firebellies, Tarahumaras, Barranquias, and Paraguaneras? Okay, so um, the answer to that question, I have my Firebellies, I have a pair paired up, Tarahumaras. I have actually got two pairs paired up right now, so my fingers are crossed on those. Uh, Barranquias, my Barranquias are not old enough to breed yet, so they're not paired up this year. They might be paired up next year. I do, however, have some Coupes Pastel Colombians paired up, which are similar to the Barranquias. And then finally, the Paraguaneras. I don't have Paraguanera animals anymore, so I won't be breeding these this year. Uh, probably not in the future either, so no Paraguaneras from me. Okay, what time of year do you expect babies? Do you have any online testimonials? So my babies are born typically in the spring through the summer, sometimes into the fall. Uh, typically my first litters arrive around May. Uh, you know, June, July are pretty busy as far as litters. August is usually pretty busy. My red tails are typically born a little bit later, you know, July, August. Sometimes the red tails continue into September and even October. Um, but my busiest months of the year are generally June through August for baby boa births. And then as far as online testimonials, I don't have like a formal place where people have written feedback about me, at least that I know of. But if you go to um, Facebook and you do a search under Brian Boas, people have written things about me, people have my boas, you can check those out. Uh, there used to be a forum called the Board of Inquiry on the Fauna Classified site where people could write positive and negative comments about different sellers. Um, it it did render, degenerated into some pretty um, spirited discussions sometimes, particularly with the negative comments. And you know, some of them were kind of uh, uh, illustrative, not just of the sellers, but of the buyers as well. So you might want to go check out Board of Inquiry if you're interested on Fauna Classifieds. They don't have the Board of Inquiry anymore, but as far as I know, you could still go back and you can read people's comments. I'm not sure if anyone ever commented on me on the Board of Inquiry, but you might want to check that out uh, if you have a few minutes. Okay, next question. Have you tried feeding boas, baby boas, frogs legs? Uh, no, I can't say, I say I have. You know, sometimes if your baby boas are being finicky, you might want to try feeding them something other than mice or rats, and sometimes that'll work. I have not tried frogs legs. If you want to try that, let me know how it works for you. Uh, another feeding question, can boas eat rats only, or do they need rabbits also? So it's best whenever possible to vary a boa's diet somewhat rather than just feeding it one type of prey item. If you can feed a few different types of prey items, it's probably better as far as for its nutrition, you know, certainly probably better for the boa. You know, would you want to eat the same type of food every single meal for the rest of your life? So you can probably use rats as kind of the main staple diet, but you want to mix in some mice and some, um, I feed a lot of birds either 
baby chicks or quail as well. I don't feed rabbits. Um, rabbits tend to be more expensive and you know I kind of feel a little bit bad about feeding a cute little bunny to my snake to be quite honest. So typically I don't feed rabbits and my boas seem to be doing fine. But I do try to vary the diet as much as I can. And um, even if a boa is, you might think is too big to eat mice, you can every once in a while give it a jumbo mouse just to kind of mix things up. You know, they tend to, or at least it seems like they like the variety. Um, so you don't need to feed rabbits to your boa, but you should try to feed a varied diet if you can. Okay, next question, do you name your snakes? So the most of my snakes I don't name, I just refer to them by their type of, you know, their locality or more for whatever they, their identity is. And then a number to differentiate them from others of the same identity. I do have a few snakes I name, um, most notably some of the founders of my lines like my, you know, Picasso and Prometheus, those were snakes that I named. Sometimes I like to give cute little names to my snakes as well. For example, I have a Pablo Escoboa who happens to be a Colombian, a Coops Colombian. So um, I don't have a Julius Squeezer. I think I did. As a kid, I had a boa I named Julius Squeezer. Um, but you know, and a few other animals I give names, but the vast majority of my boas they don't have a name. You know, I've been thinking maybe I should have names for all of them. I mean, I know a lot of breeders do. Um, maybe they can um, identify with them more if the boa has a name. Uh, it might make it easier to keep track of them, to be honest. If, you, if every boa has a unique name, then uh, that might be something that, you know, is easier to stay organized rather than the numbers. So I've been, you know, thinking about that. I do have know people that only name their boa a name that begins with a single letter. I had a friend who would only name his boa uh, P names. Okay, in fact, Pablo was one of them. He was the Colombian boa that I got from this person, and I added the last name Escoboa, uh, you know, in reference to the noted Colombian drug lord. Next question What locality boas do you think are undervalued? I actually did a video on this before called, uh, you know, most underrated boas, I think it was called. But off the top of my head, probably the number one are just your basic everyday normal Colombian boas. Um, you know, I think they're great pets for a lot of people. They have a lot of uh, positives about their husbandry and their personality as well. They're also beautiful to look at. So the Colombian, just a regular non-locality garden variety, normal Colombian boa. You might see it at your pet store. You might even be able to adopt it from a local rescue. That's probably the number one undervalued boa. Um, a few others that I think deserve to be a lot more popular than they are are the Pearl Island boa, you know, beautiful island locality boa that's very unique in terms of its behavior and its, um, its, its appearance, as well as most of the Central American mainland boas like the Honduran, Costa Rican, Nicaraguan boas, etc. Um, those, I think they deserve to be more popular and people overlook those and they wanna have you know, the true red tails or Argentine boas or dwarf boas and they you know, overlook just the regular Central American mainland boas. I grabbed another BCC, you know, thought maybe this guy will be a little bit more calm, although he isn't being all that calm so far, which is probably about the, what to be expected from a true red tail. This guy is a Suriname. He's a 2021 holdback from my, my Picasso bloodline. And I got a couple more questions to answer. The second to last question is, hi Brian, do you think Argentine boas will come down in price soon? Well, right now is probably the best time to buy because they already are down in price. You know, Argentine boas went from being um, relatively or extremely, I should say, undervalued for quite some time. And then about five years ago, they started getting popular and the price went way up for quite a while. But then COVID hit and the economy hit and, um, you know, the price has come down quite substantially in the last couple of years. So I would say if you want an Argentine boa, probably now is probably the best time to get one. And there's a pretty good chance that the price will go up again. I don't have a crystal ball, I can't say for sure, but uh, right now they are less expensive than they were the last few years. And the last question, what do you recommend as a good first boa? So a boa for someone that's not kept boas before. And so, 
Um, a couple different ways to answer this. I can give you uh, examples of animals that probably are good for people that don't have that much experience. And I've, you know, I've answered that question numerous, numerous times before. But then you can also think about it is what boa do you want? Okay, the best boa for you could be the one that you want the most, provided you're gonna do the research and give it the care that it wants. So if you think about it that way, pretty much any boa can be a good boa for you if you're gonna give it the care it needs, okay? And that's the big if. And when I answer the question, usually the way I answer is to give boas, which are the most forgiving as far as husbandry, easiest to acquire, um, and they're just going to be the best for someone that doesn't really have the experience of working with boas before. So for that reason, I would say the number one that comes to mind is the Colombian boa. As I talked about a few questions ago, the normal garden variety Colombian boa from your local pet shop, no locality. This is probably the best beginner boa. Um, you know, they're, they're, they get very tame. They're great to handle. They have relatively simple husbandry. They're beautiful to look at. They're impressive as far as the size, getting up to seven, sometimes up to nine feet, typically more like, you know, six to eight feet or so. Um, and you can't really go along with a Colombian boa if you just want the boa constrictor experience. So that being said, if, if that's a little bit too big for you, you might want to look at like a dwarf boa, something like a Tarahumara or a Qualkibo that's not going to get quite as big, but it might not be quite as laid back and handleable as a Colombian boa. And then you might be in the camp that you really love the red tails, you, you're just, you know, you're blown away by the beauty and um, you figure, well, you know, a boa is going to live upwards of 20 years plus and I really want to get the boa that I want, but that's fine. So there's no law that you need to keep a simpler boa before you get something like a red tail, a true red tail, provided you do your homework and you give it the ideal husbandry that it deserves. So the best boa for you is really the one that you want the most and provided you're gonna give it all of the husbandry requirements that it needs and not compromise on anything in that area. So I hope today's episode was somewhat helpful for, for you and some of these questions uh, were ones that you have thought about as well. As always, keep the questions coming and you can uh, write any comments you might have on them or on any of my episodes below. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.